Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Sleeping Beauties by Stephen King and Owen King. So I'm going to start by reading the blurb, and then I'm going to go through and sort of pick up on some of my flags and share some of my thoughts as we go through the book. At this hour, we're continuing to follow a breaking story. Medical officials are reporting the outbreak of what some are calling Australian fainting flu. Around the world, something strange is happening to women. They're falling victim to a sleeping virus which shrouds them in a cocoon-like gauze. If woken, if the gauze is disturbed, the women become rabid. In the small town of Dooling, West Virginia, the virus is spreading through a women's prison, affecting all inmates except one, the enigmatic Evie. The abandoned men are starting to fight one another, while the town sheriff, Leela Norcross, is just fighting to stay awake and solve the mystery. But the clock is ticking, and the women of Dooling are about to open their eyes to a new world altogether. So, I've heard kind of mixed things about this, and actually I've kind of been putting it off for that, but I have been really enjoying it, so at the moment while I'm filming, I haven't quite finished. But that's quite cool because it allows me to give some sort of predictions, in terms of, I think that, basically these women are, are falling asleep and they're getting this gauze and then they're waking up in this new town, which is like a new version of the town they're in. And because obviously it's Sleeping Beauties, I'm guessing that that's a hundred years in the future or, or whatever, so I don't know how it's going to all wrap up and bring it all back together but it also has some quite interesting stuff I think to say about uh, gender and like specifically like what women's influences on society and what would happen if that was taken away we have a reference here to the jinx which is a show I watched a couple months ago he wants to be caught she had said to Clint when they were watching an HBO documentary the jinx it was called about a rich and eccentric serial killer named Robert Durst this was early in the second of six episodes he would never have agreed to talk to those documentary guys if he didn't and sure enough, Robert Durst was currently back in jail. The question was, did she want to be caught? And also here we have a little reference. A Leela is the town sheriff, uh, and she's not asleep. She had read in a magazine article, probably while waiting to have her teeth cleaned or her eyes checked, that it took the average person 15 to 30 minutes to fall asleep. There was a caveat, however, of which Leela hardly needed to be informed. One needed to be in a calm state of mind, and she was not in that state. For one thing, she was still dressed, although she had unsnapped her pants and unbuttoned her brown uniform shirt. She had also taken off her utility belt. She felt guilty. She wasn't used to lying to her husband about little things and had never lied about a really big thing until this morning. We have here what I think is quite an interesting look into the sort of the psyche of one of the cops. So um, it says, he held open the cruiser's back door for her and this called up another memory, the limousine he'd rented to go to the prom in with Mary Jean Stuckey. Her in a pink strapless dress with puffy sleeves, the corsage he'd brought her at her wrist, him in a rented tuxedo. This was in the golden age before he had ever seen the white-eyed corpse of a pretty girl with the crater of a shotgun blast in her chest, or a man who had hung himself in his hayloft, or a hollow-eyed meth-addicted prostitute who looked as if she had less than six months to live. Hard job being a cop, I wouldn't want to do it. My uncle's one though. I like this little, uh, this little sentence here, it's about Judge Silver and uh, the cat. Um, the cat has been hit by a car, he says. Silver wasn't crying now, but he had been. Frank hated to see that, although it didn't surprise him. People loved their pets, often with a degree of openness they couldn't allow themselves to express toward other people. What would a shrink call that? Displacement? Well, love was hard. All Frank knew was that the ones you really had to watch out for in this world were the ones that couldn't even love a cat or a dog. See, I got Biggie Cobain, so I'm alright. I'm not nuts. I like this little insight. Civilians had no idea how much nonsense you had to listen to when you were a cop. The public loved to salute police officers for their bravery, but no one ever gave you credit for the day in, day out fortitude required to put up with the bullshit. While courage was an excellent feature in a police officer, a built in resistance to gibberish was, in Lila's opinion, just as important. Lila's a great character as well, probably my favourite character in this. We have this guy who's into uh, meth, and we just have this little pop culture reference. The bag was blue plastic so the rocks appeared blue until you removed them. This was probably true Mayweather's half-assed tribute to Breaking Bad. And I like this as well, it's just, uh, he attempted to take down an 800 number, but the only penny couldn't, but the only penny could find didn't work on the skin of his palm. And I think we've all been there where we've tried to take a note down on our hand and it hasn't worked. So I didn't actually flag for another hundred or so pages from here, so make of that as you will. But then we get back to it here. We have a news anchor who goes crazy basically because the other guys are saying that the reason all the women are having this problem is female hysteria and she goes what the fuck are you talking about you penis equipped gerbil she shouted I have two granddaughters with that shit growing all over them they're in comas and you think that's female hysteria women all over the world are struggling not to go to sleep because they're afraid they'll never wake up and you think that's female hysteria 
I thought this was a really interesting insight into uh, into Clint Clint Norcross. There is also at the start of this book like a list of all the characters should you need help keeping track. Clint and Richard Norcross had entered the foster system for good in 1974 when he was six, but the records he'd seen later said he'd been in and out before. But the records he'd seen later said he'd been in and out even before that. A typical story. Teenage parents, drugs, poverty, criminal records, probably mental health issues. The nameless social worker that interviewed Clint's mother had recorded. She is worried about passing her sad feelings along to her son. Which is actually one of the reasons why I don't really want kids. Also, we have an overpopulation problem, so I'd rather just adopt if, if I was going to have child. And uh, speaking of the foster care system, it says here, Girls in the system got hurt the most. Of course they did. Which is sad, but I am pretty sure that's true. We have here Lila the Sheriff. She's driving her car and um, basically this illustrates what would happen if you hadn't had this sleep. Almost too late she realised she was off the road and running into the underbrush, bound for a steep slope down which her cruiser would roll at least three times before reaching the bottom. She stood both feet on the brake and stopped with the front end of the car hanging over that gravelly drop. She threw the gear shift into park and as she did, she felt tendrils of something brushed gently against her cheeks. She tore at them, had time to see one melting away even as it lay across her palm, then shouldered open her door and tried to get out. Her harness was still on and it yanked her back. There's one character as well who has a daughter on the west coast and basically most people in the west coast just never woke up because of the different time zones. I think this line's quite interesting here as well, more Dunbar and one of the prisoners and, and she says, It was funny when you thought about it, what were all those men rioting about? Because there's been riots around the world. What did they think they could accomplish? Mora wondered if there would have been riots if it had been the other half of the human race who were falling asleep. She thought it unlikely. And she also, I mean, she suffers really badly from insomnia, which is why she's still awake. And it says, if she got two hours of un unconsciousness at night, she considered herself lucky. On many nights, she got none at all. And nights in Dooling could be long. But Dooling was just a place. Insomnia had been her real prison across these years. Insomnia was boundless, and it never put her on good report. We have a, the book club meeting and they're discussing Atonement by Ian McEwan. I read Amsterdam recently and didn't much enjoy it, but I might still re read Atonement at some point. And it says, of Margaret, for her last book pick, she'd chosen the Hemingway novel about the idiot who wouldn't let go of the fish. A book that had aggravated Blanche because it was, let's face it, just a goddamn fish. I, th I thought this was funny as well. Uh, there was an officer at the prison who competed in arm wrestling contests. Blanche wondered if there were contests for drinking wine and taking drugs and then walking around without tripping over the chairs or running into the walls. Gail might have missed her calling. I think this is good as well. Um, this explains some of the things that have been going on while everything else has been happening. The shock of the violence that had broken out in Truman Mayweather's trailer while Garth was in the john was but a prologue to what he had absorbed in the hours since, just sitting on the couch. Rioting outside the White House, a woman gnawing off the nose of a religious cultist, a huge 767 lost at sea, bloody nursing home orderlies, elderly women swathed in webs and handcuffed to their gurneys, fires in Melbourne, fires in Manila, and fires in Honolulu. Something very fucking bad had occurred in the desert outside Reno, where there was evidently some kind of secret government nuclear facility. Scientists were reporting on Geiger counters spinning and seismographs jerking up and down, detecting continuous detonations. Everywhere women were falling asleep and growing cocoons, and everywhere dumb fucks were waking them up. The wonderful News America reporter, Michaela with the first-rate nose job, had vanished in the mid-afternoon, and they'd promoted a stuttering intern with a lip ring to take her place. It reminded Garth of a piece of gravity he'd seen on some men's room wall. There is no gravity. The Earth just sucks. And Michaela is actually one of the characters we follow elsewhere. In fact, we catch up with her here, so let me read this. Ursula's Corolla was equipped with a satellite radio and, after fiddling with the buttons for a while, Michaela found News America. The news was not so terrific. There were unconfirmed reports of an incident involving the Vice President's wife that had caused the Secret Service to be summoned to Number One Observatory Circle. Animal rights activists had set free the inhabitants of the National Zoo. Multiple witnesses had seen a lion devouring what looked like a human being on Cathedral Avenue. Hard right conservatives on talk radio were proclaiming the Aurora virus as proof that God was angry with feminism. The Pope had asked everyone to pray for guidance. The Nationals had cancelled their weekend interleague series against the Orioles. Michaela sort of understood this last one, but sort of didn't. All the players, the umpires too, were men, weren't they? I love this little in-joke here reference as well. Hicks was examining the paperbacks Mora had called from the shelves. Peter Straub, Clive Barker, Joe Hill. So obviously Joe Hill is Owen Hill's brother and Stephen King's son. And Peter Straub collaborated with King. I'm sure King and Clive Barker have come across each other a few times as well. We have this little paragraph I want to read because I think this is quite realistic but also quite brutal and quite a savage commentary on our society. But basically because all of these women are defenceless, 
Somebody's tried, like a teenager's tried to rape an old woman, basically. The rapist was on the floor too, a few feet away. Actually, he didn't look like a full-grown man. There was a teenage leanness to him. His jeans bunched around his ankles, stopped by a pair of sneakers. Kurt M. read a magic marker label on the side of one of the sneaker soles. His face was a red slick. Breath stirred the bloody spit around his mouth. Blood continued to scream from his crotch area, adding to the swamp that had already formed in the rug. A stain coloured the far wall of the room, and below, on the floor, was a wad of flesh that Terry assumed were Kurt M's cock and balls. Because basically what happens is if you disturb the sleepers, they become, as it said on the rear, kind of rabid. I, like, I think this is quite an interesting idea. One of the characters says, Here is an interesting fact, Howland continued. During the second half of the 19th century, most deep mining operations, including those right here in Appalachia, employed workers called coolies. No, not Chinese peons. These were young men, sometimes boys as young as 12, whose job it was to stand next to machinery that had a tendency to overheat. The coolies had a barrel of water, or a pipe if there was a spring nearby. Their task was to pour water over the belts and pistons to keep them cool. Hence the name coolies. I would submit that women have historically served the same function, restraining men, at least when possible, from their very worst, most abhorrent acts. But now it seems the coolies are gone, or going. How long before men, soon to be the only sex, fall on each other with their guns and bombs and nuclear weapons? How long before the machine overheats and explodes? I think this is quite an interesting little bit as well. This is actually a whole section, but it's, it's not too long. Not long after the first reports of Aurora, rates of male suicide tick upward sharply. Not long after the first reports of Aurora, rates of male suicide ticked upward sharply, doubling, then later tripling and quadrupling. Men killed themselves loudly, jumping from the tops of buildings, or putting guns into their mouths. And men killed themselves quietly, taking pills, closing garage doors and sitting in their running cars. A retired school teacher named Elliot Ainsley called a radio show in Sydney, Australia to explain his intentions and his thinking before he cut his wrists and went to lie down alongside his sleeping wife. I just can't see the point of continuing on without the girls, the retired teacher informed the disc jockey. And it's occurred to me that perhaps this is a test of our love for them, of our devotion for them. You understand, don't you, mate? The disc jockey replied that he did not understand, that he thought Elliot Ainsley had lost his fucking mind, but a great many men did. These suicides were known by various names, but the one that became part of the common usage was coined in Japan. These were the sleeping husbands, men who had hoped to join their wives and daughters wherever they had gone. Vain hope. No men were allowed on the other side of the tree. And so then in, we have like a part two, which I didn't think was as strong as part one, but was still interesting, where you find out kind of where the women have gone. So this is where my theory is that they're like, they're a hundred years in the future or whatever, and maybe the men have wiped each other out. But um, we got a character here... Um, well, I'll just read this bit out. Leela had asked her on that occasion what her last name was. Once it was Wilcox, Essie said, but now it's Estabrook. I've taken back my maidenhood name, just like that Elaine woman. This place is better than the old place, and not just because I have my maidenhood name and my very own house. It smells sweeter. But uh, also what's happening is the men are seeing the women as a threat, and they're actually going around and setting fire to them in their cocoons, which is obviously not good, but also predictable, predictably violent men. Uh, we are bad people. Okay, so here we get this interesting bit about what happened to the women who were pregnant that went through. Alexander Peter Bayer, the first baby to be born on the other side of the tree, son of a former dueling inmate named Linda Bayer, breathed air for the first time a week after Leela and Tiffany returned from the wreck below Lionhead. And he's a perfectly healthy baby, but it's interesting. Leela, Leela ends up with a baby and she asks him, are you the last man on earth or the first? I thought this bit was an interesting observation on the difference between the sexes. One good thing you could say for women, she thought, one of many things, was that they usually put things away when they were done with them. Men were different. They left their possessions scattered held to breakfast. How many times had she told Frank to put his dirty clothes in the hamper? Wasn't it enough that she washed them and ironed them without having to pick them up as well? And how many times did she still find them in the bathroom outside the shower or littered across the bedroom floor? And could he be bothered to rinse a glass or wash a dish after a late night snack? No. It was as if dishes and glasses became invisible once their purpose had been served. The fact that her husband kept his office immaculate and his animal cages spotless made such thoughtless behaviour more irritating. I thought this was interesting as well in this female society. Two days ago it had been Molly at their house and the two girls had a wonderful time, first playing outside, hopscotch and jump rope, then inside, redecorating the large dollhouse Elaine had felt justified in liberating from the dueling mercantile, then outside again until the sun went down. They had eaten a huge supper, after which Molly had walked the two blocks back to her house in the gloaming. By herself. And why, and why could she do that? Because in this world there were no predators. No paedophiles. We have this little report as well. A muted television sat on a stand showing footage of several cocooned women floating on the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. They looked like, they looked like weird life rafts. 
So they've the ones, the survivors from the plane. And then Terry's wondering, what if a shark bites them? And then he's like, it'd be bad luck for the sharks. We get this little exchange as well, which almost feels forced, but I do kind of appreciate it as well. Jared sat on the floor of the laundry room while Michaela piled sheets around him, constructing a mound to hide him. I feel stupid, Jared said. You don't look stupid, Michaela said, which wasn't true. She floated a sheet above his head. I feel like a pussy. Michaela hated that word. Even as she heard more shots ring out, it touched her nerve. A pussy was supposed to be soft, and although Michaela possessed one, there was nothing particularly soft about the rest of her. Janice Coates had not raised her to be a softie. She flipped up the sheet and gave Jarrett a hard, but not too hard, slap across the cheek. Hey! He put a hand to his face. Don't say that. Say what? Don't say pussy when it means weak. If your mother didn't teach you better than that, she should have. Michaela dropped the sheet over his face. I think this is crazy as well. So uh, a bazooka fires. And bear in mind in this other world, if somebody dies in our world where they're all cocooned, then they disappear and turn into moths in that other world. And we've got here. The bazooka shell hit sea wing and exploded. In the world beyond the tree, 14 former Dolan correctional inmates disappeared, flashing once before clouds of moths spilled into the open air where they had stood. It's kind of crazy. That's 14 people in one go, you know. We get a reference here to Nora Roberts and James Patterson novels. Uh, this iron shield gets sent flying through the air with an explosion we have here. Frank stumbled over the twisted base of one of the main doors and thus his life was saved. Johnny Lee Kronsky, still upright, was not just decapitated by a flying wedge of the Fle Fleetwood siding. He was cut in two at the shoulders. Yet he staggered on two or three more steps, his heart beating long enough to send two gaudy jets of blood into the air. Then he collapsed. Brutal. I like this little uh, quote here as well. From behind them, Evie spoke quietly. The mothers will care. The wives, the daughters. Who do you think cleans up the battlefields after the shooting stops? I like as well, then we go back to the women of the world, like the world of the women beyond the tree. And the men just have to settle down and wait. And they basically get this choice where they can all go back to our world, but all of the women must all decide to do it. If even one state wants to stay behind, they'll just have this world with the women. And they all have to think about that because they understand the advantages and drawbacks of both, you know? And they decide to come back. And then we get this little passage. Cocoons, it turned out, could float. Three women, passengers on the flight that had crashed in the Atlantic Ocean, awoke in their webs on a rocky beach in Nova Scotia. Their cocoons were wet, but the women inside them were dry. They walked to an empty rescue station and called directory assistance for help. This item was relegated to the back pages of newspapers and webzines, if reported at all. In the shadow of that year's major miracle, such minor ones were of little interest. And he ends up, uh, Clint ends up working with some of the women, and he asks them, Do you regret your choice? They all said no. Their selflessness astounded Clint, shrank him, kept him awake sitting in his armchair in the AM gloom. He had risked his life, yes, but the inmates had handed their new ones over, had made a gift of them. What group of men would ever have made such a unanimous sacrifice? No group of men was the answer, and if you recognise that, then Christ, hadn't the women made an awful mistake? So yeah, there's a lot to love here, I think a lot to find interesting, a lot to discuss. I gave this a 4 out of 5. There were points at which I think it could have been shorter and the second half wasn't as strong as the first half. But I'm definitely glad that I read it and I enjoyed it. So there we have it. That's what I made of Sleeping Beauties by Stephen King and Owen King. As always, let me know in the comments if you've read this one and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.